everybody. Welcome to Muse TV. Today we have a very special guest, National Geographic, Pristine Seas, Enrique Sala. Enrique, please tell us a little bit about the show that's going to be coming out on National Geographic. Hi, Michael. Yes, uh, our show, Pristine Seas, is kind of a 10-year retrospective of our exploration of the wildest places in the ocean that we have done for the last 10 years. We have gone to some of the most remote places, places that still look like the ocean of 500 or 1,000 years ago. And we have worked with local communities and governments to protect these places in national parks. How hard is it to be, because I saw the, I saw it, it's very, it's discouraging and encouraging at the same time, because it's kind of sad to see that so much of our coral reefs and the way the ocean is being taken over by overpopulation of fishermen and everything like that. How, how was it to find these pristine places that are still left in our oceans? It was, uh, it, it was a kind of a gift from the ocean that gives us hope. So it, we do live a very schizophrenic life because we move from describing the problems of the ocean, the crisis of the ocean, which is too much fishing, too much pollution, uh, ocean warming because of climate change, but our work is to try to reverse that so we can restore the richness of the ocean and going to these places, the last places that still look healthy, that still are near pristine, is like uh, getting in a time machine. Because some of these places, you know, you go to coral reefs in the middle of the Pacific, like in the Line Islands where nobody lives and these places are still untouched. So you jump in the water and as soon as your bubbles clear, you are surrounded by 12, 15 sharks. You know, that's what the ocean should be like. Mm -hmm. And the sharks there, you know, we have never been threatened by a shark. The sharks there are a good sign that this place is healthy. Yeah. And there's a lot of shots where you literally take and there's like very little fish to no fish around kelp farms and things like that. Um, what, is, what was that? What do you attribute that to? Is it almost all, is it all the factors of global warming, fishing? What, what is it that's causing, and especially pollution, what's causing a lot of this? Because we're tied into the ocean as much as any, anybody else. So please explain to our, our viewers, how important is it and why we're seeing this where there's not that many fish around the kelp farms? Well, it is us, right? So the ocean is part of our life support system. It gives us oxygen, food, jobs. It regulates the climate. It captures much of our carbon pollution from the atmosphere. Yet we are making everything possible so that the ocean cannot help us. It's ridiculous. So basically that, there are three things that we are doing to the ocean. We are taking fish out of the ocean faster than they can reproduce. And 90% of the large fish in the ocean, tuna, grouper, sharks, cod, are gone. We kill them. Two, pollution. We have all this massive plastic pollution that everybody can see. But we have been polluting the ocean for much longer with pollutants that are invisible, like mercury or heavy metals, that the fish end up eating and we eat as we eat the fish. And three, the, the third main threat is climate change, which is making the ocean warmer and more acidic, which is killing those coral reefs and many other uh, marine habitats all around the world. So it is us, it is our broken relationship with nature that is destroying our own life support system. But the good news is that if we give the ocean space, if we create these marine reserves, where there is no fishing or other damaging activities, marine life bounces back spectacularly. And we have seen this all over the world. That's the good news. And that's something that you do touch on is the fact that if we left it to be able to rebuild itself and regenerate, that it actually helps everybody. And it doesn't take away from anybody. It actually helps this planet um, and helps fishermen. Uh, tell us how, how the, the countries that you've worked with have been able to adapt that and to bring that principle into the fishermen in their, in their countries, in their cities. Yeah, you know, there is this myth that we cannot protect more of the land or the ocean 
because we have to feed a growing human population, right? Yeah. But today, we produce enough food for 10 billion people, only that we throw a third of it or lose a third of it. So if we fix that, if we were able to reduce the waste of food, there would be food for everybody. But beyond that, the ocean has this incredible ability to regenerate, right? So what we have seen is that when you close one of these areas to fishing, one of these protected areas, the abundance of fish increases 600% within a decade. And we know that the larger females produce a disproportionately larger number of eggs. Like you, every female grouper, for example, can produce millions and millions of eggs, right? So this, together with the spillover of adult fish from the reserves, helps to regenerate, helps to replenish the areas around these reserves. So what we have seen is that the fishermen are catching more fish around these reserves than if these reserves were not there. And that means uh, better livelihoods, better food security. And finally, the, the healthier these marine habitats, the more carbon pollution the ocean can absorb. So that helps us mitigate climate change. So ocean protection is a, a multiple win. And there's one scene in this that really just like, it's just amazing is that you're in Antarctica with a big giant iceberg and your, your team is investigating and then you just pull back and it turns over and falls apart. It's, it's, it, it's something that I think when people see this, it's gonna really infect, affect them. What was that fear? And the, first the awe of seeing that and being able to dive so close to it, but also the fear of the fact that in such a quick moment, in such a quick time that you could see that literally go away. Yeah, there is quite a bit of adventure on our work. And it, it's not that we look for risk, we try to manage our risk, but sometimes there are things that happen and that are under your control. So we were in the Russian Arctic. Uh, we were the, the first uh, American expedition doing leading a, uh, a project in the Russian Arctic with our Russian colleagues. And the, there were these icebergs that come from, from these glaciers from, from the Franz Josef Land archipelago. And there was this iceberg that was anchored on the bottom of a bay. And we thought, well, it seems stable. So we went down to collect samples uh, of water near the iceberg to see what was, you know, what type of microbes live there and we were filming that and when we were about to come back to the surface after our work we heard this big crack and everybody immediately became a little worried so we went back to the surface and the people on the boat were, were yelling come back here come back here so uh, nobody knew what was going on and everybody started swimming frantically back to our our boats and then we saw the iceberg capsize the entire iceberg. So had we been underwater for one minute longer, we could have had a serious problem. Now we can laugh about it, but this was one of the scariest moments that I, I've lived underwater. Yeah, that was just, that, that shot was just amazing. And a lot of the shots that you get are amazing, especially um, with sharks and the importance of sharks in the ocean. Um, can you please explain why are sharks, because that was something you look for, is that sharks, and that's something you mentioned, that sharks show that there's a healthy environment. Can you explain, please explain why sharks are so important to the ecosystem? You know, if you go to Africa for a safari, you would expect to see lions and cheetah and, and leopards, right? If you don't see the big predators, you'd be so disappointed. Same thing in the ocean. Sharks are a good sign of the health of the ecosystem. Because if you have sharks on top of the food chain, eating everything else below them, if there are lots of sharks, means that there is a lot of everything else below them so they can support themselves, right? So that's that's the uh, basic explanation. And you know, most people, when they hear shark, they get out of the water. When we hear shark, we jump in, we love it. <laughs> that's awesome. And that sounds like such a, one, you have one of the coolest jobs ever. <laughs> Because that it's a lot of fun. Um, but last question that I, I really want to ask is the fact that a lot of people have been, there's a lot of climate deniers right now. And a lot of people that don't believe that the climate and global warming is real, when we've seen the effects, and you show it in this show so much, especially in pictures of what it once, what different areas once looked like into what it is now. 
how can you explain the importance of our part and what we can do to be able to help, to help our oceans, to be able to help, help them survive and to slow global warming? Yeah, you know, there are people who believe that the earth is flat, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Despite the, I would say, overwhelming scientific evidence. Mm -hmm. But you know what? The time of denial is gone, right? The U.S. has rejoined the Paris Climate Agreement. China has made a commitment to go carbon neutral by the mid of the century. The European Commission and many countries have a plan to completely go carbon neutral by 2050. We have a group of over 50 countries now supporting the protection of 30% of the planet by 2030. This year in October, we have an important meeting of the UN Convention on Biodiversity and Nature in November at the climate meeting. You know, there is such momentum. Uh, the denialists are in their corner spewing their things. You know, the world is moving to action on nature. And there are many things that people can do. But I would ask everyone to consider one thing, which is eat less meat and more plants. That helps not only the land, but also the ocean, because as you said, uh, everything is connected. Eating less meat, meat produces so many... Uh, emissions uh, that help uh, con contribute to climate change, or, uh, cows burp a lot, and that all that methane, it has a huge contribution to climate change. So if we ate less meat, we would need uh, less uh, land, which could be used to give back to nature, which in turn, you know, when we have these healthy forests, for example, or grasslands, they absorb more carbon and help us mitigate climate change. And also for your health, you know, we don't need to eat so much meat. We can get most of the proteins that, and nutrients that we need from plants. So a plant-based diet with some meat here and there, if you want, would be good for your health and for the health of the planet. Right. Well, thank you so much, Enrique. I really appreciate it. Pristine Seas is going to be on National Geographic uh, very soon. And we'll leave the date and a link to when you could see the show. Uh, thank you so much, Enrique. And how can people follow you? They can go to our website, uh, pristinesis.org, pristinesis.org, or just Google no, National Geographic Pristine Seas, and uh, you'll be able to hear about the, the program and watch lots of videos. And yeah, I hope that um, all of you will watch our Pristine Seas show on the National Geographic channel. Right. Thank you so much, Van Rijk, and we look forward to talking with you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael.